Welcome. You're listening to The Aligned Self, conversations in creating a conscious and abundant life. This is Daniel DeNovi. I'll be your guide and host. Let's see just where we can take this. Hello, friend. Welcome back to the conversation and welcome into this Quotable Monday. Now, you may not know it, but every Monday I feature a quote that is particularly poignant to me. And I usually give you the quote and then I expand on it from my perspective, my interpretation, what it means to me, how I might implement it in my life, how I suggest you might implement it in your life. And so it's just a way for me to honor some of the people that I have followed that have made an impact on my thinking and on my life. And I think there's a quote that, although I'm not featuring it, a quote that really speaks to this is that no man is an island. And of course, when I say man, I mean women, animals, dogs, (laughs) everybody. So no person is an island, meaning that we are interconnected, interdependent upon other people for our sustenance, for our expression, for just us being us. I've thought about this in the past, me just being myself in the middle of nowhere all alone, maybe the only person on the planet, would I think the thoughts that I think? Would I have the experiences that I have? Would I have the life that I have? Much of my life is given by the people and the the minds that I interact with. Although many times in the past, I have thought of myself as a loner, as someone, as an introvert, as someone I could sequester myself in a cabin for 100 days, 200 days, and feel just okay about it. But In the back of my mind, I would always be emerging back into society to have conversations with people. My only purpose, I guess, for me to sequester myself would be to to gain clarity in my thinking. But the purpose behind seeking that clarity is so I could articulate my thoughts, convey my thoughts in a way where they could be understood, where other people could glean lessons from them. Now, I didn't always think of myself as a teacher. But I have to admit, at my heart, I am a teacher. It is a role that I have naturally fallen into over the years. And I have to admit, earlier in my life, it was driven by uh, the wanting to be seen as a knowledgeable, wise person. But since I've been at this for a number of years, what I realized the thing that really motivates me is not your accolades. I like them. You know, it's nice to have that acknowledgement. But what really drives me is when you take a piece of knowledge, a piece of wisdom that I more than likely probably got from somebody else, and you take it and implement it in your life, it makes a difference. It strings together or connects, coalesces thoughts that you've held in your own mind, but suddenly there's an organizing principle there and you have an aha moment. I live for those aha moments. My life is fueled by this deep-seated curiosity about everything. I investigate business, different aspects of business, marketing, sales, production, creative aspects. What does it mean to deliver a product about customer service? I'm interested in all that. But also on the other side, I'm interested in health and fitness and relationships and how do I get the most performance out of my actions? Most of that is tied into the three-dimensional world. And then in the etheric realm, I'm interested in consciousness, expanded consciousness, and multiverse, and multiple timelines, probable realities, energy, manifestation. You you get it. You get it. I, I have a diverse set of skills and a diverse curiosity about everything. And if I'm reading you right, you also have a curiosity Some of you have just waking up to a curiosity about the world, the greater world at large, your mind, your capabilities, your capacities, and others of you have been studying this for a long time and have unique and profound thoughts of your own. In today's episode, I'm featuring a quote that is a business quote originally. It comes from a marketer, Seth Godin. And so since I feel you're a lot like me, I think you'll get a lot of value out of this quote, and that is make a ruckus. Go make a ruckus. Now, this quote is impactful for me on multiple levels. I'm a business. I'm a business person. I am a teacher. I have products. I have coaching. I have courses. On a business side of it, how do I make a bigger splash? How do I make a ruckus in the marketplace? 
which, by the way, is not my natural go-to way of moving in the world. Or I guess more accurately, it is not the way I've been conditioned to be in the world. See, part of making a ruckus is butting up against that internal conditioning, the programming that society has for you to stay in line, keep in step with the others, stay with the group. Don't stick out too much. Don't make a ruckus. Be quiet. Fit in. That's what society has told us over time. And I was the oldest of five kids, so it wasn't necessarily condoned by my parents for me to continually make a ruckus. My uncle was a Presbyterian minister in a small town. We all lived in the same small town. And so I was told my actions reflected on my uncle. And so there were certain behaviors that were supposedly off limits or I had to take in consideration. I couldn't just do anything that I wanted to do because there was a bigger reputation to maintain. And so either explicitly or implicitly, I was kind of conditioned to not stick out too much. But that's not to say that I was a wallflower. It just meant that I felt constrained in a lot of different ways. So this quote means a lot to me on a personal level, also on a, in a business aspect. Now, the title of another book of Seth Godin's is Purple Cow. And the idea behind that is in a field of cows, and most everyone will stop by, pull over to moo at the cows, just to take a look at the cows. Or they'll point and say, hey, look at the cows. I know you've done it. But if you were to drive by and you saw a purple cow in that herd, you would remember the purple cow. Just driving by a field of cows, all you know, all you remember is there's a field of cows. But see a purple cow? Now that's different. So making a ruckus is being different, sticking out, uh, challenging the status quo, thinking differently. And as I said, challenging the status quo, I think I need to add, because this is slightly different, slightly different distinction, is challenge your assumptions. Now this works in the business world. It works in your career. It also works on a personal level. How can you be more bold in your expression. See, one of my goals as a teacher is that I want your life to be the story of your self-expression. I've always felt like my self-expression has been, like I said earlier, constrained in some respects. Even though I was in band, I was in theater, I was at the, at the head, I was in front of audiences, but still, I was somewhat of an introvert. And I'm still somewhat of an introvert. This idea of making a ruckus, standing out, uh, sticking out in the crowd is scary to some people because it draws attention to you. And I know because I've done the same thing is you rationalize sticking out in a crowd as people or attention seeking behavior just for the sake of seeking attention. Feeding the ego, adorn me, love me, applaud me. In the context of what this episode's about, making a ruckus is not about that. It is about doing important work, being yourself, creating your life, creating your reality, regardless of the opinion of other people. Making a ruckus is making a noise. You know, with three brothers and a little sister, we made a ruckus a lot. We were making noise. We were standing out. Sometimes my mom, sometimes my grandmother would come in. What's the ruckus all about? What this quote suggests is to accept the ruckus, be a part of the ruckus, be the instigator of the ruckus. Now, some people avoid the ruckus at all costs. Now, we live in a suburban setting, and there's a fence around our backyard, and there's a, front, there's a fence around every backyard. And the neighbor directly behind us has a couple of uh, uh, aggressive dogs. Let's just say they're aggressive dogs. And so they will bark at anything that moves through the fence. Well, we have squirrels in the neighborhood, too, and so a lot of times they'll run along the top of the fence line, and then they get barked at, and they garner a lot of attention. They cause a ruckus with the dogs. Well, I've noticed that the squirrels have adopted a strategy when running down the fence along our fence line. They would actually slide down on our side, have one hand on top of the fence, and work its way. So the only thing visible on the other side is one hand. And they do that all the way down across the back of the yard until they get past the dog area. And then they jump back up on top of the fence and run along the top of the fence line. 
But it's so funny to see them do this little gymnastics thing. It's almost like stealth soldiering through the, the minefield. Just one little paw on top of the, and just working their way down the fence. That's to avoid the attention to not, to not cause a ruckus. Now, you might be asking, why would I want to create a ruckus in the first place? Well, for a number of reasons. First and foremost, if you're in the idea of creating your reality, you cannot create your reality unless you're willing to make a ruckus. Willing to live your life from inner signals, to do what you feel is best, to create the life that is best for you. Otherwise, if you're not willing to make a ruckus, if you're not willing to upset other people, or I guess be subject to the disapproval of others, then you will acquiesce and you will live their agenda. And I've done that. I've did it in the past. I don't do that anymore. And I think some of that bravado, some of that unwillingness to uh, acquiesce to other people's agenda comes with age because you realize how empty and fruitless it is to fit in with a crowd. I have lived a life for the most part since my teen years that has been somewhat magical. I've leaned into the esoteric, but do you think I talked about it publicly? No. As a peak performance coach in coaching business, as a leader in business, I did not expose the fact that I manifested. I didn't expose the fact that I was connected to energy. Now it started coming out more and more. My boss at FedEx would call me Zen. But even when I left FedEx, I didn't readily admit that, that I was into more esoteric things than... So I live on the practical side and where science meets spirituality, but I am definitely not hiding anything anymore. And part of that is because I've been willing to make a ruckus, to live boldly, to live my life as the story of my self-expression. Now, when I've looked at all my clients and, you know, I might attract the people that are like me, so you are people, more than likely, that have been indoctrinated in fitting in your life, acquiescing to other people's agendas, marching in step, staying in line, staying with the group, not sticking out too much. And there's a desire to actually live a life that's self-expressed. That's only possible when you're willing to make a ruckus. It requires developing a working relationship with fear, a willingness to be courageous. Courage is a slap in the face of fear. It's not possible without fear. So with fear also comes courage. But fear, I've said this many times, I used to think that fear meant stop, hold back, pull away, go, you know, recover. It's, it's dangerous out there. But what I realized over time is that fear is actually communication. It's my other than conscious mind communicating this is new. This is potentially uncomfortable. Nothing more. And so in venturing out into something new, you get to expand and grow. If you're not willing to make a ruckus, if you're not willing to stand out, if you're not willing to speak up, then you are going to fly under the radar. You are not going to live an extraordinary life. Now, my greatest fear for a long time, my greatest fear was to live an ordinary life, to be average, to fit in. To me, that was death. And that fear drove me for a long time. But then I realized I was focusing on what I didn't want. I was literally focusing on what I didn't want. So I asked myself the question, what did I want? Well, I wanted my story, my life story, to be the story of my self-expression and to really not have the knowing of what that looked like. It was an exploration. It was the epic adventure. It was a continual process of pushing the boundaries of my comfort zone, doing a little bit more today than I did yesterday, a little bit more tomorrow than I did today. And early on, it was always about doing things, doing things outside my comfort zone. And then I was introduced to the philosophy of ontology, the study of being. And so I realized it was more about how I was being in the world that set everything up. And for sake of a simple definition, how your being is the totality of what shows up when you walk in the room. And how I decided I wanted to be in the world is I wanted to be missed. Not for the sake of satisfying my ego that you love me or 
I wanted to be missed because when I showed up, I made a difference. The fact that I went to a party made a difference to the party. If I was part of a group, if I was part of a, you know, if I led a group, if I was part of a team, the fact that I was on the team made a difference. Anytime I do a training, anytime I do a course, I always like to say in the beginning that your commitment to show up makes it possible for everybody else. We're not just these, like I said earlier, no person is an island. We're all interdependent. And if everything is energy, then the energy we bring to it makes a difference. But far too many people treat themselves as if they're just uh, disposable. Like if they don't show up to the party, if they don't show up to the meeting, it doesn't really matter. If they show up 20 minutes late, 30 minutes late, no one will notice. We'll be fashionably late. We'll blend in with the crowd. We won't stick out. I know because I used to do that until I made the decision, and this is a philosophy that I picked up, to be a host, to assume that I am the host or hostess of the party, even if it's not my party. So when I go to a party, I want to make sure everyone's having fun. If I see someone off in the corner, I'll go over and start a conversation with them. If I happen to go to a workshop that someone else is leading then and I see that they need some assistance, I'll go up and ask them if there's anything I can do to assist them. I might help people seat. I might move chairs around. I take on the role that I'm a host. On those occasions when I'm invited to a party, I'll go early to help the host. Is there anything I can assist you with? Is there any? And then I also take responsibility for the energy I bring into the room. Because if I can assist in raising the vibration of the room, raising the vibration of the group early on, then if some negative Nelly comes in later, they're not going to upset the apple cart. They're not going to turn the tide of events because the momentum has already started. And so this is how I've decided to be, to be missed. Because the missing, if I was missed, people would get, you know, it was a great party, but something was just missing. I don't know what it was, but something was missing. It doesn't necessarily have to, I don't have to necessarily be identified, but it's the energy that I get to bring. Now, I understand that for some of you introverts, this is a crazy idea, but I have to tell you, I'm an introvert. So this is a choice. It was a concerted choice, and it's been a growth experience along the way. I just didn't step into it. I've evolved it over time. And what I realized as an introvert of not being actively involved in groups or actively involved out in the world earlier in life, I missed out a lot on relationships. But today I can say that I'm a learned extrovert and I can play both roles. Meaning that if I don't have contact with people for a certain amount of time, I start to go through withdrawal. If I'm too much by myself or too much, uh, I guess, in my own uh, environment. I need to get out in the world. But if I'm out in the world too much, I need to come back home and recharge. And so it's a balance. And so I guess you could, I'm going to sum this all up right now. Go make a ruckus because it's the only way you can live the life that you were designed to live. You came here for a reason, not to fit in, not to merge in with the crowd. You came here to be you unapologetically you and the only way you can do that is be willing to make a little ruckus until next time this is your friend and host daniel de Nove, urging you to follow your bliss live your life from inner signals be inner directed as you engage in the epic adventure (laughs) 